Okay, hello friends, and welcome to an exciting Chabura public shiur. Today we have the pleasure and privilege of having with us our Rosh Bet Midrash, Rabbi Joseph Dweck, the senior rabbi of the SNP. Tonight we will be exploring the nature of the Torah Shabal Peh and how this aspect of Torah allows for our covenant with the Almighty. There is no one better to give over this fundamental and apropos shiur than Rav Dweck. Uh, for those who are new to the Chabura, welcome. Uh, we are happy you are here with us. Uh, feel free to follow us and check out more of the amazing content we have out there. And uh, hopefully we can see you back as full members. And a small announcement, stay tuned for the release of our new curriculum coming up very soon. Uh, the Chabura team has worked very hard curating a cutting edge curriculum with scholars and Chachamim from around the world, covering a wide array of relevant and important topics. So stay tuned for that. Uh, with that said, tonight's shoot will be recorded and available later on our website. If you have a question, please raise your hand and please God there will be time for questions at the end. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this special Shavuot Shiur and Ribi. Thank you so much for being here with us. The floor is yours. Thank you, my dear Rav Ohad. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are other people better that can give this Shiur, <laughs> but I appreciate the opportunity to do it. And I'm very always, always look forward and grateful to be able to share Divre Torah with the Chabura, the, 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 uh, the Chavirim on the Chabura. And what we want to speak about this time, I do think it is an important, and I always think it's important, but this is, this is one of the fundamentals, right? These are one of the, the core principles of Torah. And I wanted to do this before Shavuot, so that we could kind of come into Shavuot, which we call Ziman Matan Torah Tin. We call it the time of the giving of our Torah. Um, I've given other shiurim or other classes about that, you know, that... Um, there's no indication in the Torah itself that this is Zaman Matan Torah Tenu, outside of kind of counting the days, but that was what we do. Um, but nonetheless, the Hachamim see it as that, and they've established it as Zaman Matan Torah Tenu, the time that the Torah is given, which of course means that every year there's a question that's posed for us as to whether it is that we wish to receive it. One can give something, but uh, something being given, of course, requires an agreement to receive. So, um, what I want to look at with you tonight, uh, or this afternoon, wherever you might be, if you are in a different time zone, why is it that um, we have this oral aspect of Torah, and why that aspect of Torah really is what the covenant is based on? Yeah, and we'll look at the fact that the Hachamim say that, that it's the, the oral Torah that the, that the covenant itself is based on. The covenant, when I say the covenant, of course, I mean the covenant between Akadosh Baruch Hu, between God and Israel that was established at Har Sinai on both sides, in both parties. So what I'd like to do tonight is to be able to address that. But the way that I want to address it again is through a story in the Torah, right? There's a very important story in the Torah that is that is presented to us, and it's in this story, which is in Pirashat Mahalotecha, that we find the core underpinnings, the seeds planted for this concept. And I'd like to present to you these basic ideas through the story. And so we'll look at this story together, and then we'll look at some of the developments in Halakha that come from it, and from that help, help us, I hope, to have a better understanding of the nature of the covenant of the Torah, right? How the Torah manifests within the covenant and why specifically Torah Shabal Peh is so important with regards to that. So these are not complex ideas. These are fairly straightforward, simple ideas, but nonetheless ideas that are not often spoken out this way. Um, so uh, for Shavuot, in honor of Shavuot, Zaman Matan Torah Tenu, to help us better understand and receive our Torah, choose to receive it, I thought that I would present this to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share the screen. We're going to read a little bit and we'll go through this story. But before I do, a bit of a setting, right, for this story. So as I said, this story is brought in the Torah and Perashat Balotecha. And it is a, a relatively well-known story. I mean, if you're familiar with the basic stories of the Torah, then you know that there was a period, there was a point in where the people got a bit tired of the manna that was dropping from the sky for them on a daily basis. And they complain for meat. They want meat. Now, it's not the only time that people complain. The people complain for water. They complain for food. They complain about a whole bunch of things. A whole bunch of things throughout their career, you know, with Moshe Rabbeinu and the 40 years that he spends with them. There's all kinds of things that are problematic. 
all kinds of things that they raise issues with, whether they do it through complaints or through actions, right? There are certain actions that are very severe and problematic, and Moshe has to deal with these things. But what is peculiar about this particular story is that from the point of view of Moshe, from the point of view of him and his career, his work and job, what he was hired by God to do, from that point of view, this is the worst incident that he experiences in the entire 40-year career that he spends leading B'nai Israel. There is nothing worse to him than this strange request of the people to have meat. And that's what I want to look at. I want to look at the fact that this is a tremendous devastation to Moshe Rabbeinu. There is nothing that even comes close to this and this severe to Moshe Rabbeinu in his entire career. You understand? The entire 40 years, nothing comes close to this. And we're going to look at this in the text itself. And from that, hopefully understand a little bit more about the nature of the Torah and and all of that. We'll see, I hope clearly enough why, why, why it is the case. Right? So we remember, of course, that Moshe Rabbeinu lived 120 years. He spent the last third of his life at, in this job. So in case any of you were concerned about, you know, your progress in life and so on and so forth, you know, Moshe was 80 years old. As the Pasuk says, Moshe ben Shmonim Shana Aaron ben Shalosh Shmonim Shana B'daberam el Paro. So uh, the, the highlight of his, of his life at the end of the day was from 80 years old and on, the last 40 years of his life. So let's have a look at this, this story and, and kind of understand what it is that's going on here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share the screen. Okay, and I'm going to move this over so that I can see it, because I understand that you see it. And here we are. So the story is they're going through the desert, and this is again I said in Parashat Baraltecha, So there's a whole bunch that says I don't love this English translation. It just kind of is an automatic translation that goes on for Safari, and I put it there just for a bit of you know buttressing for you, for people that want it. But but it's essentially the asafsuf comes from the word yasaf or or mosif, right? That there's an added element of the people. And it says that when the people left Mitzrayim, there was a whole bunch of people that left with them that wanted to tag along, that were not necessarily part of B'nai Israel. And it says the Asafsuf that were within B'nai Israel, they had this, this desire that was coming up, right? They had this yearning that was coming up, which is interesting. Now this, this Tava that was happening with the Asafsuf affected the whole cloud and it ended up affecting B'nai Israel as well. And B'nai Israel started crying, right? Complaining, kvetching as a result of this. And they said, Mi yachilenu basar. Now this is very interesting language because it's not just saying anachnu rotzim basar, anachnu mitavim le'echol basar. It's saying, who's going to give us meat? So that's a very important thing to recognize in the, in the language over here. Not we want meat, but who's going to give us meat? Which means that somebody's missing, right? Somebody is, <laughs> should be around that should give us meat that isn't around. Nobody around right now is able to give us meat. We remember what we ate in Egypt, chinam which is the key word over there, right? We got it for free. We didn't have to do anything for it. We didn't have to worry about it. We couldn't, uh, you know, with the man, there's a problem because the man, you constantly have to go out and get it, which is minor, but nonetheless, it requires effort and work. If you wanted to store a week's worth of man, you couldn't do it. You had to have it out every day. You had to go out and get it. And God gave it every day, and every day you had to come out and get it. Every God gave it, every day. and there was this give and take and interaction. We used to get this stuff given to us without any effort. And at this point, our souls are drying up. We have nothing. We have no. We have no cucumbers. We have no fish. 
We have no onion. We have none of that good special Egyptian cuisine. All we have is haman einenu, el birti alman einenu. All we see all over the place is the man. The haman kizraga, this little parenthetical side point here, just to tell you what the man is like. I know kind of bedola. It was, it was not very hearty, right? It was quite quite light in its nature. And it says what the people used to do, right? So they would have to gather it and kind of be creative with it and, you know, make, maybe make cakes out of it and toast it or whatever it was that they did. But it had a nice taste. Tamo ketam right? It was, it was very fatty. It had a nice, fatty, rich, delicious taste. And it tells what used to be done with regards to this. But you run down a little bit and it says... Right? So Moshe hears that the people are crying. Each family is crying. And they're crying publicly. Right? So this is a mass disaster. Right? People are complaining and crying. Everybody's sitting outside. The whole nation has fallen into melancholy. Why? They want a barbecue. They don't get to have a barbecue. So who's going to make us a barbecue? We're not going to a barbecue. We're, we're miserable. Now I want pay close attention to the response here. Right? God gets very angry. And in the eyes of Moshe, it was really bad. Now it's interesting. Moshe is not getting angry. God's angry. But also notice that there is this separation between God's response and Moshe's response. They are not the same. Yeah? And it's not just saying God got angry and Moshe had to talk to God about it. It's not saying that Moshe heard the cries of the people and went to go talk to God about it. That's not happening here. This is something that personally bothers Moshe. Moshe He sees that there's a problem here. And he's upset about this problem. Now, pay attention to what Moshe does. Now, why do I say that? Because in all other circumstances that there were complaints, what's the protocol? I mean, we're familiar more or less. I think almost everybody here is familiar more or less with the stories. Usually what happens is the people either do something wrong or complain, and Moshe intercedes. So either Moshe scolds them or chastises them and then speaks to God about it and sees what to do. Maybe he doesn't scold them. Maybe he goes directly to God and asks what to do. And, and, you know, uh, pleads on behalf of the people. Maybe he only scolds them and leaves it be. But this, this is weird. Because Moshe doesn't scold the people, even though Moshe Ra, he's upset. And then he turns to God. And what's interesting here, and this is very important to pay attention to, he does not start talking about what the people said or what the people want. Not here. What he starts talking about is how he feels about this. Very personal. So what does he say? All of a sudden, this is a God problem, not, a, not the people problem. He says, you know, how, how could you deal so badly with me? How could you do such a horrible thing to me? What do you mean I could do such a horrible thing? That's Moshe's first response. He goes, I cannot believe that you've done this to me. What have I done not to find favor in your eyes? Why are you treating me this way? And what are you doing to me, God? I'll tell you what you're doing to me. You're putting the burden of all of these people upon me. Well, I mean, Moses, that was why you were hired. I don't understand. What's your, what did you think? You were going to be taking, uh, you know, a couple of people out of Egypt. You knew exactly what you were. No, for some reason, here, here, Moshe never says this. Here, Moshe all of a sudden says, I can't handle the burden. Why? They need a barbecue. I can't, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with this. No, you can deal with a golden calf, right? And people dropping dead, but a barbecue is too much for you to handle. You can deal with people going to the land of, of Canaan coming back with horrible reports later on, right? That happens in the future. The entire uh, reason you were hired has failed. The entire nation falls into pandemonium. That you can manage, 
But a barbecue, that's too much for you. The barbecue, all of a sudden, God's putting too much on you, which is exactly what's going on over here. And then he continues. And he says, I mean, what, did I conceive this nation? Did I give birth to this nation? The Jews should say to me, I should carry them in my bosom? Like a nursing mother carries the, the, the suckling infant? You want me to do this and bring them into their, their land? This is absurd, says Moshe Rabbeinu. This is, this, is, this is too much. This is already, this is crossing the red line. And then what does he say? Where am I supposed to get all this meat? To give this people? Because remember what they say, right? who's going to give us basar? Not Moshe. Right, that's in the, the, the silent part of that. And what Moshe says is, I can't believe that you have put me in a position in which I can't give them meat. Do you hear that? That's exactly what's going on over here. That's what Moshe is saying. Now, the question, of course, is why is this such a big deal to him? Why is he making such a big deal out of this? Now, he continues. He doesn't stop here. He says, wait a minute. I can't do this myself. Well, you don't, not doing it yourself. You got a Haron, right? Miriam's there. There's a whole bunch of people, Yoshua, a whole bunch of people are helping you. No, no, I can't, I can't do this myself. My administration is not enough for this. It's just too, too heavy for me. And you know what, God? You know what? You know how I feel? If this is what you're going to do to me, you're going to put me in situations like this? Just kill me now. What's the point of my life? I mean, if I find any favor in your eyes, you should kill me. I shouldn't have to see my wretchedness. So do you, do you hear what's going on over here before? I want, we, have to, we have to understand this. Do you hear what's happening over here? I mean, you almost want to say, like, okay, I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu Shalom, settle down. What on earth? Why should a complaint for me be such a serious attack on you? Why are you taking this so personally? And why are you throwing everything to God, right? Saying, how could you do this to me? Kill me now. What, what, what do you think I am? And so on and so forth. There is this response of Moshe Rabbeinu is unmatched in the entire Torah. It is the worst devastation that he experiences, and it is a turning point. But what we need to understand is why is the meat the thing that causes this? Right? So I want to take a look back at this. Right? We're going to unpack a little bit more as to what it is that he's saying over here, because, because it's very important to, to look at the analogy that he gives. Right? Because when he says, I can't do this myself, how could you do this to me and put me in such a horrible situation, right? And what is the horrible situation? The people want some meat. Yeah. He says the following, right? Let's have a look at what it is that he says again. He says, have I conceived this people? Did I give birth to them? That you should say to me, Sa'ehu behakecha, carry them in your bosom, like the nursing mother carries the infant. Now, this is very important because Moshe here sees himself as a nursing mother. Yes, he sees himself as a nursing mother. And it's also very important to recognize that Moshe really didn't have any major male role models in his life growing up. All of the people that were prominent in his life were women. So Bitya, the daughter of Paran, his biological mother, Miriam, his sister. He doesn't have any real major male role models that he looks at. So he says, I am like a nursing mother carrying an infant. And that's what you've asked me to do. I can give milk. I don't know where you think that I should give meat. How am I supposed to give them meat? 
So this is very important because what Moshe is saying is not just saying, where's the butcher? You know, where I don't see any butcher on the, on the highway over here, you know. He says that later. And we're going to see why he says that in a minute. But what he's saying over here is, I have been hired to carry this nation in my bosom like a nursing mother carries an infant. I was not hired to provide barbecues. I was hired to provide mother's milk. And that's what I provide. And that's what you asked me to provide. And so if that's what I provide, and that's what you asked me to provide, how could you do this to me? How could you put me in a situation in which I am completely ill-equipped, completely failed at being able to respond to the situation? Right? What, was this some kind of joke? Are you laughing at me, making a mockery of me? I mean, if kachat oseli, if that's what you're doing to me, horgeni naharogen, just kill me. I mean, if you, why you're putting me in a situation in which I am not the right person for the situation. I know how to give milk. I don't know how to do the meat thing. And yet you put me in a situation that needs to give meat. Kill me. So no, instead I should sit and look at my own wretchedness and my complete embarrassment of not being able to do what everybody needs me and wants me to do. And that's why the people say, certainly not Moshe. And Moshe says, it's certainly not me. And yet you're putting me in this situation. How, how mean. That's essentially what Moshe is saying, Takadosh Baruch Hu. Lama hareota. Have I not found favor in your eyes that you should put me in such a situation? Now we have to understand, what, what, what is this? Big, we got to dig a little deeper because, okay, what is this thing that Moshe is saying that I'm a, I give mother's milk, I'm a, I'm a milk giver, I'm not a meat giver? Incidentally, I think that the secrets as to why there, there is a minhag to eat uh, dairy on Shavuot, right? I don't think it's a small minhag. I think it's a very valuable minhag. I just think the reasons given are poor. This is the best reason, in my opinion. But here, here I offer you what's happening in this story. Re recognize that all milk in this world is mother's milk. All milk is baby food, right? I mean, that's the definition of a mammal. Right? Mammals give milk to their young. So if we understand that, I mean, we just get confused sometimes because we, we use cow, we use the baby food of cows in our diet, which is questionable, but that's what we do, right? So we forget sometimes that milk is not just this product, right? All milk is baby food. All milk is mother's sustenance for infants in the mammalian world, which means that milk itself has characteristics to it that are unique to it. And what are those characteristics? Characteristics are that it's pre-digested, it's designer food, right? It's on demand, and it has all of the nutrients necessary for, building the, for providing the building blocks of biological life. And that's what Moshe was doing. Right? One of the indications of this, the hachamim say that the man that they were complaining about that fell from the heavens for them on a daily basis was in the zechut of Moshe Rabbeinu. Hachamim say the clouds were in zechut of Aharon, the be'er was in zechut of Maryam, and the man was in zechut of Moshe Rabbeinu. And the man that was in zechut of Moshe Rabbeinu, the hachamim compared to, guess what? Mother's milk. In many, many ways. An example is that the, the hachamim say, I mean, I'm sure you've heard these midrashim before, right? The hachamim say the man tasted like whatever you wanted it to taste like, except for garlic and onions. Couldn't get garlic and onions with the man. And the hachamim say, interestingly, that, the, that a mother should, who's nursing should not eat garlic and onions. That's Chazal's advice. Well, that's interesting because they say Zacharnu et Abatzam Tashum, right? We remember all that. We used to have like these nice, uh, you know, seasonings in in Egypt. We just can't get it out of the out of the man. You know, it tastes it tastes like you know maybe cream and 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 honey and and you know nice fatty dairy stuff. You know, it tastes like a, a nice tea perhaps, but but that's it. Another thing the Hachamim say is that the man had no waste. 
So for 40 years in the Midbar, there was no need for a restroom visit, right? A, a, a convenience uh, a stop, comfort stop. And Chazal say the same thing halachically about mother's milk. Why? Because we know that you're not allowed to read Kriyat Shema, for example, in front of human waste. And the Hachamim say, well, what about a baby who's nursing exclusively? What do you do with, you know, if the nappy is around, you know, for such a baby that, that's only nursing? Well, the Hachamim say that's not waste. So there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, the, the mother's milk is full of nutrients. There is no waste. It's completely absorbed by the baby. It has everything the baby needs for its building blocks and for growth. So you can read Kriyat Shema. Once the baby starts a diet of cereal, well, that's a different, then that's waste and you're not supposed to read Kriyat Shema anymore. And then the halakha is that you, should, you need to, to separate from it. Well, it's interesting, right? So yes, indeed, Moshe is giving mother's milk, at least if you recognize the man is coming in his zechut, but there's more here, there's more here. Because this is not just about meat. Meat is only the symbol. Now, if we think about meat in contrast to milk, you don't have anything that is more opposite to it. Because if milk is pre-digested, it's on demand, it's immediate, has all of the nutrients, no waste. It's what babies eat in order to be able to form the most basic biological building blocks for their life. Meat is the exact opposite of that. You, you don't get a more adult food. Why? Well, what does it take to have a hamburger? Consider what really, really has to happen in order for you to have a steak or a hamburger. Well, first you have to kill the cat, the bull, right? Slaughter. And that's only after we domesticated them. You used to have to hunt and gather, right? You have to, you, you have to spend all day finding the animal. All right, all right so you domesticated them. Now they're in the pen, right? Let's, let's start with that. Well, you have to slaughter them. And of course, you have to skin them. Of course, you have to clean them. And of course, you have to cut it up appropriately. And then once you've done that, well, yes, I mean, you know, you can, you can, oh, well, you have to cook it also, right? Yes, right, you have to cook. Oh, and you have to really, you better make sure that you got your choppers in, right? Because otherwise, good luck. Well, you have to chew it really well. And then, and of course, you have to digest it, which is about a two-week ordeal. Yeah, I mean, you don't get more opposite than that. Perhaps one of the reasons why the Torah doesn't like meat and milk being mixed together, but I just speculate, right? That's only, you know, as Harambam says, but whatever, it's just something to consider. However, we do recognize that the complaint for meat is a complaint that is coming from a very particular perspective. They're tired of being little children. They don't want to be infants anymore. They don't want to be infants anymore. And the man is keeping them infants. And guess who else is keeping them infants? Moses. Why? Because all Moses does is nurse. Even the information. Right? In other words, in that same parasha, Ba'alotecha, which incidentally is huge. I mean, it is the major parasha that teaches so many of the fundamental principles of Torah on so many levels. Oh, this is for another Shiro. One of the things that, that, is, that is brought out in Ba'alotecha is this strange question that the people have. It's not that strange. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an understandable, significant question, but it's strange because of the nature of it, right? There's, there's a situation in which it's the second Pesach, and the people know that they're not allowed to do Korban Pesach because they're Tamil Nefesh Adam, the Tamimit. They've been in contact with a dead body and therefore impure. And they can't do the Korban Pesach while they're impure, and they're not going to get pure in time to do it in time for Pesach. So they come over to Moshe. This hasn't been addressed. I mean, Pesach was decreed. There was a mitzvah of Korban Pesach given. There was never a contingency plan for people that are Tamei Met that can't do it. All we know is that people are Tamei Met can't do it. So they come to Moshe and they say, Lavani Garan, why should we be left out? 
I mean, you know, just because we're Tameh, we should be left out of such an important mitzvah. It's, one, it's the only other mitzvah that I say besides Brit Milah, the person has karet for not doing, and we should be left out of such an important mitzvah. What does Moshe say? It's a very good question. I'm going to ask God. None of this, well, let's think about it. Let's see if we can figure out some kind of, you know, dedu- you know a deduction from, from the Pesukim. Maybe we can be Doresh, some, some halakha. From, no, no, that's not happening. Just go as God. All right, go to the source. What's the problem? So Moshe says, oh, go as God. He asks God, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, yep, good question. They can do it next month. Same date next month. Well, that becomes part of Torah Shebikhtav, right? That's written down for all the Dorot, right? Written in, in the text. And there's other times where this happens in the Torah, like with the Benotze of Had, for example. Every, this is throughout the entire regime of Moshe, right? Moshe's administration does not give room for individual considerations, for your own understanding. There is no room for that. As long as Moshe is alive and God is present within the people, there is simply givens. And that's what mother's milk is. Eat. You don't even have to digest it, right? It just it absorbs. You don't have to chew it. You don't have to digest it. You, oh, you, you cry, you got it. No problem. It's on demand. And it's what it is. It's on demand. Go and ask God, and he answers you. That was the uniqueness of Moshe Rabbein was Nebuah, according to Aramba. He could access God on demand. And that's what he gave the people. And that's why Moshe is saying, I hear what they're saying over here. What they're saying over here is not just that they want a barbecue. They're saying they want to kick back. They want a new administration. They want miya chilenu basar, not miya chilenu halav. And Moshe rightfully heard that as a rejection of his leadership and his whole regime. And what is Moshe's leadership? Torah Shebikhtav. Whatever I get from God, written down. You want to deduce new things? Fine, I'll go ask God and he'll tell us what to do. And that gets written down too. But this openness to be able to consider how we interpret what it is that's written down, that is locked away as long as Moshe Rabbeinu is alive. Now here is the remarkable thing. If you read the story, interwoven into this story is more than just the meat issue. Moshe says, I can't do this myself. And what is he complaining about when he says, I can't do this? What he's saying is that I am not sufficiently staffed because I am one kind of leader. And if we're going to deal with meat problems, then we need meat leaders, not milk leaders. Or we need meat leaders with the milk leaders. But I certainly am a milk leader. That's what you asked me to do. And guess what, God? That's what I'm doing. And how could you? How could you do this to me? How could you put me in a situation? What are you, just laughing at me up there? You put me in a situation where they want meat and I've got no meat to give them? Now, here is the key factor. When he says all of this to God, the response to of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is remarkable. Because it's not the first time Moshe's life where Moshe said, I don't think I'm the right guy for this job. It's never this severe. Well, where else does Moshe say, I don't think I'm the right guy for the job? Well, when he's hired for the whole job, right? I mean, back at the burning bush. Except there, HaKadosh Baruch Hu's response is very different than HaKadosh Baruch Hu's response here. There, HaKadosh Baruch Hu's response is, Moses, please, please, you protested too much. I mean, who, who made you know, uh, the ability for people to speak? Because that's Moshe's problem. I, I don't know how to talk. Well, I made you. I made talking. Isn't that funny? I, I'm, I'm the one who made talking. So I can help you with that. I know how to wire it. Yeah, no, I get that, God. I understand. But I really, I think you should probably send somebody else. It's not for me. Moses, we're sending you. I'll be with you. Don't worry about it. I'm going to support you. No, I don't think God gets angry at Moshe after this. He says, enough already. All right, fine. I'll send your brother. 
Daberi the bear who I know he knows how to talk, and you better say what I tell him what I say, and you're gonna do what I tell you, and we'll do this. Now go, you're going. That's what he tells him. Here, Hakadosh Baruch Hu doesn't say Moshe, please stop already. You know that you could none of that. What he says is, you're right. Leave it with me. I'll take care of it. So Agadosh Baruch Hu is not saying, Moses, you're wrong. What he's saying is, no, I, I hear you. You're absolutely right. You're not set up for this. And I always knew that you were not set up for this. And I'm not going to ask you to do thing, something that you're not set up for. Leave it with me. I'll get the meat. And that's where the part where Moshe has trouble, right? Letting go, right? But I'm not going to focus on that too much tonight. There's a very interesting and very important lesson that comes from that. We have a principle in the Torah. This is a side point, right? We have a principle in the Torah that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not put us through things or test us with things that we don't have the capacity to come through. And Haram Bam writes that explicitly in the morning of Bukhim and others write that. And that's why Moshe was getting so upset here. Because he didn't have a doubt that this was not something he could do. He knew he couldn't do it. And he felt, if I can't do this, how could you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, how could you put me in a situation that I'm not able to do? He was rightfully indignant about it. And what HaKadosh Baruch Hu's response is, I'm not asking you to do it, Moses. Leave it with me. I will take care of it. And the challenge was, can you leave it with me? And that's something for all of us to learn. Again, this is parenthetical. This is bracketed. This is on the side. But this is also in here. In which we will find ourselves in situations in life in which we're tested and we have the wherewithal to be able to move through it and achieve greater elements. And then there are times in life where we just don't have what it takes. And we have to know the difference, first of all. And second of all, if we do know the difference, when we know that we are not in control of something, can you give it to God? Which is what Moshe is, is being told to do over here. And he even struggles giving it to God. Because then after all of this, he says to God, he goes, well, where am I going to find all the meat? I did, did, I, did I ask you to find all the meat? I'll find the meat. I didn't ask you to find the meat. Leave it with me. Now, there's something else that happens intertwined here. And what is intertwined in the story? It's remarkable when you read it, right? You look through the story. The funny thing is, is that the response to Moshe saying, where am I going to get all this meat to feed the people? What's HaKadosh Baruch Hu's initial response? Get me 70 people. He doesn't say, oh, don't worry, I'm going to get you the meat, right? He does that later. But that's not his first response. The first response is, let's have a look. First response is, Moshe, you know, this whole thing about you not doing this on your own. No, I hear you. I hear you. And you're not, you're, you know, you're not the meat guy. You're the milk guy. I get that. So we're going to do, we're going to do something here. We're going to start something here. He said, Moshe, ish Do me a favor. I'd like you to gather 70 men for me. From the elders of Israel. You know them to be proper elders, right? They're respected. They're recognized by the people. Bring them all into oil moed. Let them stand with you. I'm going to draw from your prophetic spirit and put it onto them, like lighting candles, right? And well, not going to take anything away from you. They're going to be in, inspired by the prophetic by the prophetic spirit. They will stand with you in the leadership of the people. Now, interestingly, at this point, it's still only Nebuah, but there are other people that are now sitting here with Moshe Rabbeinu. So I ask you, right, this, this, when you read that and God says, get me 70 men, what immediately comes to mind when you hear 70 men? What should immediately come to mind is the Sanhedrin or what we call the Beit Din Agadol, right? The Supreme Court of Israel. The Supreme Court of the nation is comprised of 70 elders, 70 hachamim. Here is the prototype 
for the Sanhedrin. And what spurs the prototype of the Sanhedrin? A complaint for meat, which essentially is a complaint for individuality. It was early and it was rebellious. And that's why God's response to it is angry. Right? You impetuous teenagers, you're not ready for what you think you want. And you want meat, I'll give you meat. I'm going to give you meat not for one day, not for two days, and not for a week, and not for two weeks. I'm going to give you meat for 30 days, and it's going to be coming out of your nose. And next time you'll think twice before you complain for things that you're not ready to handle. But I hear you. And I understand that you want individuality. And I'm going to start that ball rolling right here, right now. I'm going to set up the prototype of the Sanhedrin. And I'm going to get 70 men together, and they are going to be the first cohort of this court. Now, they are going to be Moshe-type people. They're going to be prophets, which means that they also, if there are questions, will use prophecy to answer, which we will find out later on that ends up becoming invalid after Moshe Rabbeinu's death. You're no longer allowed after Moshe dies to use prophecy to answer the questions the way that Moshe used to. No, from now on, after Moshe dies, you got to figure it out. Do you know what we call that? What do we call that aspect of Torah that allows for the human being, Israel, to answer unanswered questions, previously unanswered questions, through analysis of the written text? We call that Torah Shabbat Peh. That's the major crux of the oral law or the oral aspect of the Torah, right? That's the non-written bit. That is the non-concretized bit. That is the non-stuck bit. That is the bit that is constantly fluid and moving, number one. And number two, that is the bit that resides not with God, but with us. And guess why that's so important? Because if we didn't have that, there would be no covenant to speak of. Covenant, by definition, is two-sided. And if the only side that was functioning was the God side, well, then we would be sidelined and there would be no covenant to speak of. The whole idea that we should, at some point, have the capacity to interpret God's bit which is the given bit, which is the written bit, which is the part that doesn't change. Those are the principles that we must always deal with, that will always be there, that will never go away. But how we interpret them, how we understand them, that's our own individual aspect of involvement in this breed, in this covenant, and in the Torah. The oral Torah is our side of the covenant. You with me? So what's being complained about over here is early and it's impetuous and it's childish and it's rebellious, but it is not unrealistic. It's just early. It's like a teenager wanting to grow up too fast. And the reason why Moshe took it so personally and was so upset with it, because he thought this is a genuine complaint and he's going to need to respond to it. And he's not set up for this. Why? He's set up for the written Torah, which is mother's milk, which provides the building blocks for everything that's going to grow afterwards and the individual, the individual human being that will eventually stop nursing from its mother, become weaned, and stand on his or her own two feet. Are you with me? That's what's going on over here. So the Sanhedrin is established here. Where else would it be established? The most perfect place. And every subsequent cohort of the Sanhedrin becomes what Harambam calls Ikar Torah Shabal Peh, the very source and roots of, of the oral aspect of Torah, which is our part. And let's have a look at Harambam. First, I'll, I'll show you this Gemara in Gitin that says what I was just saying about the covenant. The covenant was only established with Israel, says Rabbi Yohanan, based on the fact that there are Devarim Shiba'al Peh. 
That's where the covenant lives. God could talk all he wants. There's no covenant in that. There's just givens. Covenant happens on the other part of it. That is the oral part of it. That is the fluid part of it. That is the part that is interpreting what is concretely defined or concretely uh, uh, um, formed, formulated, rather than defined. The oral aspects can redefine. So it says, Ki al Israel. Says the Gemara, it's based on the P Hadevarim. P is literally the mouth, right? What's spoken, the spoken bits are what I have established and cut this covenant with you and with Israel, he says to Moshe. So it's very important to understand that. And why is that? Because it's our bit, it's our part, it's what's been given over into our hands. So therefore, Harambam says in Hilchot Mamrim Aleph Aleph, Bed Dina Gadol Shebirushalayim, which of course is the Sanhedrin, which of course is the seventy men, that that's prototypical, prototypically expressed in the Parasha Baalotecha that we read. Hem Eikar Torah Shebaal Peh, they are the very roots of the Torah Shebaal Peh. Hem Amudeh HaHoraa, they are the pillars of Horaa. What is Horaa? Hora'a is the same word that Moshe uses. He says, hariti it's the same root. Hara, hora'a. What that means is conception. And we use it exactly the same way in English. Because we don't talk only about the conception of a child. We talk about concepts. We conceive of ideas. And hora'a is conception. Hora'a is the conception of interpretation and ideas. And it's very unique, right? It's not just saying over a law. As a matter of fact, even in Shohan Aruch, Maran says, Kola more hora'a b'fne rabbo, hayamita, right? He brings that halakha. You're not allowed to be more hora'a in front of your rab. What does it mean, more hora'a? It means you're not allowed to conceive of new interpretations of Torah or law, specifically law, in front of your rabbi. Who are you to start conceptualizing law in front of somebody who's a master that's sitting before you, which is what literally what Rav means. But if it's a matter, says Shohan Aruch, if it's a matter of saying over a halakha pesuka, that's not a problem. That's nothing. You can do that in front of your rabbi. It's Hora'ah that's a problem. So what Harambam is saying is, Hem amude Hora'ah. They are the very pillars of conceptual establishment of, of innovative law and concept in Torah. Umehem, and from them, that means they are the nucleus, right? They are the conceivers. It's from them that everything starts. And not only does it start, not only is it conceived of, it spreads to the entirety of Israel from that nexus. From them, the statutes and judgments go to all of Israel, nowhere else. They are the center point. They are the focal point. And, and the reality is, is that the Torah secured itself on them. That's what Hiftiha means, right? Sara Bitahon. The Torah secured itself on them. Why? Because as long as they are around, Torah is relevant. As long as they are around, Torah is alive. Torah is responsive. Why? Because that's why, as we'll see in a moment. You got to go to the judges that are in your days. It's the only real realistic context that you ever have if you have a question in Torah. What are you going to go to? The dead, the dead judges? You're going to go look at the, at the written uh, the written the written logs? No. You go to the court that's alive at your time. And it's upon them that the Torah secured itself. Why? Because they you, you don't have a law in Torah. There is no mitzvah in the Torah that does not require interpretation for action. It doesn't exist. There's not one. You need them. And that's why, by the way, now that we don't have them, we're in dire straits. And we've been in dire straits for thousands of years. And why we pray for them every single day. 
Hashiva Shofetinu Kebar Yishonah, we say. Return our judges like they used to be. And what? what? Yaseru Minu Yagon Ve'anaha. Take away the agony and despair that we live in on a daily basis because we don't have them. No responsiveness, no innovation, no conception. We're stuck with a petrified Torah. And that's why Harambam says over here, sorry, not this. If you have a Bedin that did actually use the, their rules, you know, it's not you and me deciding the interpretations. No, there is an, an established body of judicial authority that has the capacity to interpret law in a binding way to all of Klal Yisrael, to all of the Am, when the Am is intact and the government is intact. And the judiciary is intact. Well, if that's intact, if they end up going through and interpreting a mitzvah, as they see it, literally, that should, the law should be as such, and they establish that the law is that, and after them, another bedin gets up, a later generation bedin. And they find a reason why this shouldn't be the interpretation. They interpret it alternatively. Well, they, they can al give an alternative explanation. And they judge as they see it. As it says, you go according to the judge is in your days. You're only obligated to go after the Bedin that's in your generation. Rashi in the Pasuk says almost exactly those words, but leaves a little out, and he says, it's a different nuance. He says, <laughs> The only thing you've got is the judges in your days that are relevant to you. How essential that is. That's why the oral Torah is the basis for the covenant. What covenant is there if we don't have that authority? Where are we in all of it? What is it, just a spectator sport? And that's why it was so important, that whole story about the Loba Shamayim he business between Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Elaezer and Rabbi Akiba, right? That whole story in Baba Metziah. Why they insist so adamantly, Loba Shamayim? Why? Because you want to abrogate the Brit? I mean, this is what makes us us. This is what this is our part of the relationship. And that's why the Torah at the end, you know, in the Gemara in the end, later on, they ask Eliyahu Navi, what was Akadosh Baruch's response to that? It was like, it's Runi Banai. It was great. So what that means is, what it means is, is that without the Sanhedrin, as the tefillah itself indicates, when it says yagon v'anaha, there is horrendous agony and despair without it. Why? Because our brit, our covenant with HaKadosh Baruch Hu is severely truncated and hindered. And that's the reality that we don't like to address. But it is. And we're terribly missing as a result of it. And we should be, because recognize that that is part of galut. And it used to be that we managed, but it's getting to a point where we can't deal with it anymore. Now, it may take another 200, 300 years, I don't know, until it gets to the point where B'nai Israel really just cannot stand it anymore. But I will say this. It is true that we don't have the capacity for conception anymore. And we cannot go to the motherboard anymore and reinterpret mitzvah. We have to follow what the last Sanhedrin established. And that's essentially established for us in the Talmud. And that's what Harambam wrote the entire Mishneh Torah for. I mean, he basically distilled what the, what the, what the decisions were. That's the whole Mishneh Torah. It's just what did the Beit Din Agadol establish in all, throughout all of Torah? What did they establish? So it's a beautiful, I mean, it's very important because we need to know the cases. We need to know what the Beit Din decided. Because we have to follow the, the last Bedin. We don't have a Bedin that will go against that. And I will say also parenthetically, a lot of people say, what's the difference between orthodoxy and conservative and so on and so forth? 
and and the, and the things that I find people saying about orthodoxy, you know, are are often mistaken. In in my understanding, there's only one thing that all or the people who identify with orthodoxy hold, and that is that we don't go against the decisions of the Beit Din Agadol. We recognize at the end of the day, we must deal with Talmud and the things that it decided. There's difference of opinion as to the interpretations of how to understand the Talmud, but nobody says we don't need to worry about what it says in orthodoxy. In conservative Judaism and Reform Judaism, they say, we don't need to worry about that. We'll do it. We're not waiting for the Senate. We're doing it ourselves, enough of it. And as a matter of fact, we might even you know, uh, start to, to tamper with the text itself also. We don't, I mean, I, you know, we don't have to look at these parts of the text and deal with these things. So that's what they, that's the difference. Even within orthodoxy, there is a massive range. And where does the range lie in this? We can't conceive anymore, but we can apply. In other words, we can apply law that has already been established to modern situations. And there is a huge field of opportunity in that area alone. What do we do with the current situation? How creative can we be in establishing the laws that were already decided into the new circumstances? And what about the things that weren't spoken about? What can we do there that is innovative and responsive and current? That field is wide open. And in that field, there is a range of response among Orthodox Jews. On the one end of it is don't do anything. Be as, as, as unchanging and, and unresponsive as possible. Hold, hold, hold. Hold what has only been and what we've always done till death do you part. And then there's a range as to how much we give in that area and how much we respond, we respond and allow in that area. And what I'm suggesting is, is that it's the only thing left we have in the covenant. It's the one area left that we can still be active in the Berit, because that whole other part of the Berit has been locked away from us as a result of Avonotenu Harabim in the Galut. It's a punishment that we don't have a Sanhedrin. It's not just a circumstantial situation that we have to deal with. It's, you know, you mo'esbo, so then okay, until you get to the point in where you're dying for it to have it back, then okay, we'll keep it away, see how we like it. But we still have an opportunity for engagement and we still have an opportunity to, in, to respond. And that is in that field of application. And we need bravery and courage and creativity and responsiveness and clarity in that field of application. And we need to know what the nature of the world is in order to be able to be in that field of application and what people are dealing with. And the more that we are engaged in that area, the more we are engaged in the Brit and the areas of the covenant that we still have available to us. And it is essential. And so I'm saying something somewhat radical that to the degree that we don't engage in that field and to the degree that we remain removed from responding and, and uh, innovating in terms of application, we are stepping away voluntarily from the Brit. And that is a serious problem. And that's why I'll, I'll share these bits with you. You know, this lovely line by Adin Steinsaltz that he writes in Strife of the Spirit, which I highly recommend. It's a lovely book. He writes, Torah that is not a living framework for action is no longer Torah. And if I were to interpret what that means, it's no longer Torah because it's no longer part of the covenant. And the Torah is only the, the constitution of the covenant. So here, of Shmuel Glasner, so I'm not going to get into it, and so on. So I leave that with you. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer in the time that we have. But otherwise, I wish you all a Chag Sameach. Wow, Chacham, thank you so much. That was a beautiful presentation. Thank you. Um, if anyone has a question or comment, they can raise their hands. What do we have in the chat? No, Yitro was not a male role model for Moshe. Yitro was his father-in-law. Moshe was already uh, quite an old, older adult. I'm talking about when he was growing up. Immediately before his story, Yitro Chovav leaves. 
Oh, I guess that's yeah. All right, good. Oh, this question. How do you know what is in fact in line with the covenant as opposed to going off? I'm not sure I understand the question, but the Torah outlines it. The Torah tells us. And so we have to be able to understand it. But there's many levels to what it is that you're asking. Are you talking about the Sanhedrin? How do they know? What, what's considered a mistake for them? And so on. All of that is quite detailed. I mean, all, the whole of Masechet Horayot deals with that issue if you're asking with regards to Sanhedrin. With regards to us, you have to study the Torah because that's all guidelines for the Brit. Was the event of Yitro setting us the judging system related to this issue of Torah Shabal Peh not being static? No, it was not. The only purpose for that, and it didn't remain. That, that system did not remain. That was only in order to be able to ease Moshe's dealing with the people. And not only that, Moshe actually later on speaks about it in a disparaging way. He says, you know, I, I set that up because the, the situation required it, but you should have rejected it. And you didn't. And that's on you. So, uh, no, no problem. Okay. Very good. Okay. I bid you all good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you so much, Chacham.